welcome. I'm Annie Jacobson with Jacobson Dementia Care Coaching. We work with families, medic one first responders, professionals that are working with individuals with dementia to better understand why there's some of the challenges that people face when working with dementia. So today our topic is when the diagnosis is dementia and we're looking at both understanding of why things are happening and action that we can take. So we'll be covering first their brain changes their changed perception and experiences and why that then makes the behaviors change. <clears throat> and third, what we need to understand to support and also minimize difficult behaviors so that we can all have as much mind, body, relational wellness as possible in a very difficult situation. So our session objectives that you may have already received are identifying the three areas of the brain most significant in early stage and mid-stage dementia especially. They really are the aha moment for a lot of people I work with. Uh, also understanding at least two changes that the well partner, and by well partner, that may be a family member, a paid professional, a crisis unexpected situation where you realize that somebody has cognitive change, okay? So we are the well person with a fully functioning brain. So two th changes that we can make as the well person as we approach the person living with dementia. You may see through my slides that I've used PLWD. That's become a fairly common, uh, you may see it more often, person living with dementia, way to refer to that individual. And then the third objective is two ways this knowledge will improve both our quality of life and the quality of life for the person living with dementia. Okay, so I always wanna start with compassion supports connection. Everything in dementia care is about connection, okay? That individual, and we'll understand more as we go through the session today, needs to feel connected with, or everything's gonna be more difficult. And that compassion is both for ourselves as the well partner, because this is really hard, especially if it's a loved one, but also in professional situations. It's also compassion for the person who's living with dementia because their whole world's changing and they're grasping at straws a lot of the time. So first, we're gonna look at getting curious, being creative. What are they perceiving right now? What is their experience that they're having? We wanna know about that. And then be creative in how you um, look at the environment around them, changes you may make. I've got flittering light through the leaves coming through the window right now. For me, that's lovely. For somebody with cognitive decline, that may be really disturbing or confusing potentially. So the second is considering their perception. What are they seeing? What are they feeling? What's their temperature? Is that fabric that used to feel nice scratchy now? There's all sorts of things that they're perceiving that we're gonna do better if we can put ourselves in their place a little bit and we'll understand more what's going on with their perception. And then finally, we need to honor both who they've been and who they are now. First story, I was early on in this industry and my dear friend Brian was working at a memory care community. He's showing me around and there's this woman just pacing in the hallway and she's just agitated and she'd only lived there a couple weeks. The next week when we spoke, her daughter had come in. They hadn't filled out the personality profile that memory care communities should always give you for your loved one. If they don't, go somewhere else. <laughs> they really need to know who the person is. But the daughter let him know that she had been a school teacher. So Brian had the epiphany to grab all the scratch paper from the printer and a red pen. Come three o'clock, she was grading papers and happy as could be. She wasn't agitated and wandering anymore. He had to know who that person had been to even consider that solution for where her agitation was coming from, okay? An engineer is gonna stay fairly particular, an engineer kind of brain. A floral artist is gonna stay more artistic. So we need to know who they've been in their life, okay? And then who they are now, because that can change minute to minute. Later on, we're gonna talk about dynamic assessment. And that's one of the ways we identify where somebody is in this moment. So the first part today, um, I, I'm missing a slide, I apologize. Their brain changes are um, the first section we're gonna talk about today. So dementia umbrella, this has been a great tool. Whoever first came up with this, thank you. Dementia is often talked about as a diagnosis and it is not. 
Dementia is a list of symptoms, okay? The actual diagnoses are the raindrops underneath the umbrella you'll see here. Alzheimer's, Lewy body, vascular dementia, frontal temporal, and then there's other dementias, Parkinson's, Huntington's. I had a 52-year-old woman in a memory care I worked in who had been chemically damaged working for a phone company. She was managing the off product and she couldn't speak, she couldn't communicate. She loved Wham, I would play music and she enjoyed the music. So there were still ways to connect, which is part of what we'll look at today. But that was chemical damage that created her dementias. So it's the umbrella term. So think about that, it is not the actual diagnosis. If a doctor simply tells you they have dementia, they haven't gotten to an actual diagnosis yet. They're saying there are symptoms that will then become a diagnosis. So the definition actually is a group of symptoms affecting memory, thinking, and social ability. So it's not simply memory, which is the first thing we often talk about. It is severe enough to hinder daily activities. So if you can still get dressed in the morning, but it's a little bit slower, you know how to work the coffee pot, maybe it takes you three hours to get through your morning routine where it used to be an hour, you're doing okay. You may just have some general slowing down. But if you're putting your shoe in the toaster and you're pouring your coffee on your cereal, the, and especially if you're driving, there's certain things that become hindering daily activities. So that's one of the paramount things we look at. Currently, there are no cures for true dementias. Uh, progressive, it's one directional. You can have good days and bad days, and we'll talk about that a bit. But overall, it, it is one directional. And dementia is eventually terminal. We say that people age in reverse with dementia. Well, eventually, the mind forgets breathing. It, it, it loses the ability for respiration, for swallowing. Those type of things begin to shut down towards later uh, dementia, Alzheimer's or Lewy body, any of them. And then there are other things that sometimes people think are dementia. Delirium, that often occurs when there's a hospitalization, especially an unexpected one. You may wake up in an unfamiliar area that you don't really understand how you got there, be on medications, you've got bright lights, bells, alarms going off, tubes. That's going to throw everything off it will go away when you get home. I get calls saying my mom was fine Tuesday on Friday when she came home from the hospital, she's totally got dementia. And we care for the situation, but by Monday, she's mom again, okay? That's situational and that's delirium. Depression can certainly parallel depression, uh, dementia and needs to be addressed, but depression by itself is not dementia. A lot of older individuals maybe feel a lack of sense of purpose, they've lost loved ones. Depression is very understandable. So we want to treat it if it's paralleling with dementia, but it is not by itself dementia. The third thing is hearing loss. A lot of untreated hearing situations, their cognitive abilities can be much improved once the hearing loss is managed, okay? So these images can be a little startling if you haven't seen them before. On the one side, we have a normal brain, on the right side, we have somebody who died of, al of advanced Alzheimer's. These were from two men of similar body size, similar age, similar education. So by all practical measures, the brains should be very similar. On the left, you see a full, lush, juicy brain. On the right, there's a lot of atrophy. The ridges are further apart. All of that affects how the brain functions. You've got less surface area, less ability for the neurons to fire. Below is a cross-section of the interior of the brain, again showing atrophy, gaps, a huge reduction in overall brain matter. So in the brain with dementia, there are permanent changes structurally. There's that less surface area, the la less cortical area for the neurons to fire and everything, the connections to happen. There are also chemical changes, less neurotransmitters and, and, and other chemicals. One thing that happens is they say, well, they go to the doctor and they present so fine. Chemical rushes can occur and then they shine. That person with dementia can really seem like they're firing on all cylinders. 
and then they come home and if you're their well partner, you know they crash because they've used up all the reserves. It's not even intentional. It, it's a body mechanism that's happening. It's a survival mechanism. The hippocampus is our learning and memory center of our brain. The top, again, is a healthy brain. The bottom is a Alzheimer's dementia uh, postmortem brain. You can see this huge area where there isn't even tissue there. That's where immediate recall is stored, why you walked into the room, what that person just said. Mom, I just told you. Yeah, see that big gap? That's why you just told her and it's not there. Focus and attention to detail are in this atrophied area. So are relationships between items, between people, between everything. The way things relate to each other is stored in that area. Things that are actually preserved in a, a different area are long ago memories. Those aren't stored here where it's gone. Confabulation is the brain's ability to fill in. If, if there's a story they're telling and they want to look good. I mean, our brain's trying to keep us healthy and, and safe, right? So we're trying to look good and we're not going to say, oh, I don't know, I don't remember. A lot of people are going to confabulate and put in information, make something up to fill the story. And this is very common with a lot of earlier stages, dementia. Emotional memories are also stored well. And motor memories, the ability to do something you've done a million times, such as brush your teeth, those motor memories are stored in a different part of the brain. Uh, the temporal lobes are where there's language and sound, and these are distinct to understand because a lot of people talk louder to people with dementia automatically. That's not necessarily the case, and we'll go into why in a minute. But sound, you'll see the two red circles on the slide. Those are pretty similar looking. Now let's look at language. The blue arrows point to the area of language. Look at the right side, Alzheimer's brain. It's hollowed out, it's darkened, there's just much less matter there. That's where language comprehension and production lives, okay? So these are the three parts of the brain I mentioned at the beginning that we're gonna really look at. What's lost, what's retained, and what's elevated. On the left side, there's some, a mnemonic here, left and right, you like. The left side is where language and logic are stored, and it's where we lose first in dementia. So language, both the ability to produce language and comprehend language, to recognize objects, okay? Logic, things that need to happen in sequence and step, executive functioning, all of that begins to go away in the earlier stages. That's an area that really atrophies in the brain, okay? On the right side, however, and I hope you're people window doesn't cover that up entirely. Um, right side, we've got rhythm, emotion. If you've heard that music is really great for people with cognitive decline, part of it is because this right side of the brain's hanging on to that. And rhythm, um, people who've been very involved in a church or, or, or read the Bible regularly, psalms that have a rhythm, poetry, all of those things really stick around in that side of the brain. So do social norms and behavior. We had one woman who could come up and she'd say, oh, good morning, God bless, and walk on. And everybody thought she was doing great because she could engage with anybody. If you took it one phrase beyond good morning and God bless, oh, where do you want to go for lunch? Like deer in the headlights. She, she could do the greeting she had done. It was a rote thing. It was over and over and over in her life but she couldn't create new, that ability to move forward with something new, novel, um, that, that ability was gone, okay? So the social behaviors. The third part of the brain, and this is where our work really kicks in, is, I apologize, uh, there we go, is the amygdala. Now these red things, they're kind of right in the middle, it's hard to locate them, but there's two of them. And the amygdala are our fight or flight center of our brain. They're the part that looks at keeping us safe, protecting us from harm, running away from the dinosaur, okay? So the amygdala's job is to sense, prepare, and respond to danger. Now that's real danger or perceived danger, um, ri risk of falling, but also of embarrassment, of shame, of loneliness. All of those things, it's protecting us from those, okay? That's the amygdala's job, is to keep us 
safe. And what our mind thinks of as safe can be a quite broad spectrum. It also perceives emotions and anger. So with these parts where we've lost language and in language, some of the first part to go are nouns. How hard is it gonna to be to communicate with somebody when they can't come up with their noun or conceive of their noun? Also, one of the early ones is negation words. Don't touch that. The don'ts go away. So we're losing language, but we're retaining emotion and rhythm and things. So if you're like, hey mom, we're gonna get up. Uh, okay, on three, one, two, three. That's a rhythm we've all done dozens and dozens and dozens of times throughout our life. So that's retained and we can really work with that. And we need to know about the amygdala and the brain's desire to keep itself safe and thinking about what safe means to that individual where we're caring for. The, what, one of the things of the amygdala, an example I give is we're losing logic, okay? And we're keeping our emotion. Emotion isn't logic. Emotion is the body's reaction. Feelings are the, the more mental part of it. So emotions are chemical release, all of that. If we hear a bam, we all get scared. Oh, oh, it was just a car backfire. We're okay. You and I can realize what it is with logic and bring ourselves back down. Now that person with dementia doesn't have logic. They got alerted and they're there. They, their emotions are, are triggered. Their, their pupils are, are dilated, their muscles are tight. All those things that happen when we're fearful and they don't have logic to help bring themselves back down to, oh, okay, I'm safe. So that's a pretty dramatic example, but in day to day, once they get themselves up there, we need to help bring them back down or it takes them a long time, okay? Um, so what changes in their perception and experiences and why that affects the behaviors will be our next part. Um, this gentleman, the first time I saw this image, it really impacted me. Think about looking and knowing, okay, these pieces go somewhere, but you just can't put it together. You know things are missing and, and just heartbreaking, but also this is where that compassion really comes in, okay? We can support this. So people with dementia are having changes in executive functioning, sensory awareness, self-care and regulation. So they get mad, sad, scared, often because they're trying to work with their new functioning in these ways or their lack of functioning. Some early to mid-stage dementia folks are highly aware of what they're missing. Some people I call blissfully unaware. So where your person is may depend. Executive functioning. What they have lost in executive functioning, we've talked about logic, sequence, impulse control is lost. Also, they, they focus on one thing. So one I saw was a woman I was supporting had the, the pot of water on the front stove and it's a gas stove and she saw something beyond it. She'd move the kettle and she just reached right over the flame because her focus was on that thing over there she wanted. It didn't bring in the entire environment. So impulse control, judgment, risk assessment. Focus gets narrower. You're focusing on one thing. So taking in the car coming from the side, those type of details get much more difficult. Um, working memory is you walk into a room, why'd you come here? That short-term memory. Sense of time and place goes away. Um, you've probably often heard, can you tell me what, where you live, what the date is? Those kind of things go away. And if I wake up and see my hand and I have age spots and everything, but in my brain, I'm thinking I'm 20, that's starting off my day very disoriented. Okay, emotional control is lost. It just spikes. They don't have the ability to say, hey, calm myself down. What are preserved are, and this is challenging, fear, protection. No becomes the default because it's safer, isn't it? If, you, if everything was difficult, everything was hard, the more you say no, the narrower it is and the variables go away. So by function of the brain, not handling as much stuff easily, by nature things get a little more concerned, not politically, but conservative. They, they narrow the lanes to have less things to think about. And so no often becomes the safer or questioning what other people are doing. Um, 
and that self-protection, that amygdala is on overdrive. So we really want to think about that. The sensory awareness is a lot of where falls happen. Maybe people are eating foods that are no longer safe because they don't recognize that they've gone bad, this type of thing. So things that are lost, as I adjust myself, awareness of body position. They may sit in one position way too long and not move, and then they could get sores. Body feelings, the sensations change. What has sense changes. Um, where light touch can be nice to some people earlier in life, most people with dementia don't like light soft, light, soft touch. They prefer firm pressure. And we can talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, a trick for caregivers in communities or at home is ability to locate pain. Uh, something hurts, but they can't identify that it's their elbow. So we need to be doing body scans, looking at their skin, those type of things. Uh, ability to express pain is something that comes up. Um, it hurts, it hurts. Well, what hurts? You know, they may be tapping their foot, but they're actually constipated. So it can get very difficult and it takes a little bit of being curious, exploring, knowing the person, looking at what time of day this comes up. If they're always like, oh, it hurts, it hurts. And it's an hour after mealtime. Oh, okay, good information. So things that are preserved that this can cause some really interesting situations. Um, sensitive areas, the mouth, okay? Uh, palms and fingers, the soles of the feet and genitalia. So when they're trying to get something that has sense and feeling, this can cause uncomfortable situations, but we need to really decide, is this a problem or just maybe a little awkward? Is this important to deal with and urgent or is it just a little unusual? You know, think back to a one and two and three year old learning their bodies and, and coach and, and have some compassion there. I put this picture in because falls are one of our biggest concerns with elderly. And in the memory care community, I saw two people fall within my first week there. Both of them had been sitting in a chair and they were rubbing the, the arches of their feet on the chair or hook their toes behind the chair. When somebody said, oh, let's go, think about all that happens with getting your feet untangled from the chair, your feet on the floor, getting up and going. Their brain isn't putting together the logic or the sequence. So they're focused on going over there and their feet are tucked under the chair and they go straight down. Okay, so we need to think about how we approach. Their feet were under the chair because they were getting sensory stimulation. They were rubbing their feet on the chair or tucking their toes, doing something that gave them some stimulation. Their focus can only be on one thing at a time, really. And their logic of the sequence that needs to happen to stand up safely isn't there. That becomes our responsibility. So a little bit more on sensory awareness, vision changes. Peripheral changes are pretty significant. And if you have your arms out to the side, um, bring them in so you can see your fingers wiggle. We tend to have pretty good peripheral. In all seniors, it narrows. In dementia, you wind up being kind of like sticky goggles, down to binoculars, eventually down to monocular vision. So vision changes dramatically. And when I have caregivers saying, she won't drink any of her fluids, I have them do monocular or binocular vision, look down at the plate they've given, the glass of water is completely out of the field of vision. They're not seeing it because the caregiver thought they'd set it off to the right side, but it's set a little too far out of their vision, okay? Another thing with that is offset colors can be really good. White mashed potatoes on a white plate, mm, you'll see a lot of the memory communities have yellow or orangey plates for the food and that can be really helpful for people but peripheral vision is one we want to think about especially when we approach how often do we come around from the side right up to somebody they may not even remember we were there if their field of vision is about this wide and i come in from here i'm going to come out of nowhere so we need to use our voice we need to ensure eye contact these things um, and they're Focus is narrowed to either task or social. Right now, I'm on the task of this, 
but I am aware that somebody just walked by the window outside. So I'm able to do both of those things. When you have dementia, again, everything's narrower, narrower and harder to fa- focus. So if I say, oh, can you hand me that glass? They're going to have to scan past the laptop, the paper, the pen, the, oh, and that process is much slower for them to shift from one thing to another, also to move from task. I'm taking a bite of my sandwich. Oh, but then you want me to engage you in conversation. That's social. Those are very different functionings of the brain, and it's very difficult to do both of them, okay? Um, Physical, touch changes, that light touch that can be disconcerting. We need to be careful of older skin, but one of the lovely things is palm to palm can be very, very comforting. And if you are the well partner, you want your hand on the bottom. But this kind of embrace, palm to palm, actually releases the, um, is it the oxy, whatever, it's the mommy hormone. That, That releases some of the mommy hormone. So it's a lovely feeling. Also, firm pressure on a joint. If you need to wake someone up who has dementia, even anybody, this is a nicer way to do it, approach from the foot of the bed and put a firm hand on their ankle ankle, knee, hip, and shoulder are the best places, okay? Those main big joints. Put a little bit of soft pressure on there. Hey, I'm here to get you up today. Or on the knee, that's what I use with my dad is the knee typically works well. So a little bit of firm pressure on the knee and it is a gentle waking up, but this dusting can feel like spiders. It can feel itchy. It's it's a very disconcerting. The light touch isn't nice. Um, Taste also changes. So where taste buds reduce, sweet and salty are what remain. So ice creams, potato chips, those things, which we need to watch dietarily, but good rich protein foods, nutritionists who work with dementia are fantastic and they've got great information. So if you're facing that, there's a lot of good information out there. Um, but watch for sweet and salty because that's what they're going to be called for because those things still register and we're looking for stimulation. Okay. Self-care and regulation is the third part that gets really hard that we need to be thinking about as we're working with people with dementia. The lost abilities here are the ability to initiate, also the ability to terminate. Have you ever heard of someone who puts on six pairs of underwear? What's going on is, oh, I need to get dressed. And they get stuck in a loop. Okay. It's not, they're not trying to be difficult. That's, that's the big thing I want people to understand is their brain got on that thing they needed to do, but the ability to terminate that action isn't there. For some reason that, that connection isn't happening. So you can initiate or terminate. A lot of times you can't do both. So there's this repetitive nonsensical seeming behavior. Tool manipulation, the ability to use fine motor skills goes away. Um, Also sequencing, the thinking about making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you've got the bread, the jam, the peanut butter, and the guy was just staring at it. He could, he knew he wanted to make a sandwich but getting the bread out of the bag as the first step, that sequencing, that logic wasn't there anymore. Um, Also response time. Okay, mom, we're gonna get up out of the chair, push yourself. Okay, let go of the hand, let go of the arm, let go of the arm. I hear that all the time. To get the signal from the brain down to the hand, you're already losing language, okay? So you're having a harder time understanding what the person is saying potentially. Maybe you're not even getting the nouns. You're having to get that signal all the way down. The messages just take a lot longer. So like training a dog, you want to say it clearly, fewer words, say it once with eye contact. The other is, and we'll go into this a bit more, but giving them visual cues to go with the words since language is lost. But know that their response time is going to be slower. It takes a long time to get all those pieces together if they are even understanding what the instruction has been. So things that are preserved, a lot of the bigger gestures, okay? So some people even just get flamboyant in the way they're doing things because that's what they've got. Um, that, that's what they feel like they're able to share. I've got a couple notes here for stories I wanna add in. We'll see if they get in there. Um, 
But the, the one that I think about, the doing part, um, we, I had a downsizing and relocation company and we had a woman who I didn't realize was mid-stage dementia. The way we'd been introduced, it all started pretty quickly and she was gonna need to move quickly. And very, after our third day, we very clearly realized she had some cognitive decline. But we went in and we packed her up the first day and we were coming back the next day to finish. Every box was unpacked, opened. Everything we had done was undone, dug in, because it was different to her. She didn't understand why. She got into doing and she just dug in and in and in. But she didn't remember that we'd been there before, okay? So she got into digging into everything. Um, another thing that's preserved that people can do is cute activity. So my friend's uh, mom at Thanksgiving has become an issue, big family. And she, what they did, her first couple of years of cognitive decline was have her taken away by the cousins. They'd make dinner and she'd come and sit in the table and cry the whole time. Her sense of purpose, meaning here's this big thing that this was, I wasn't part, none of it made sense. So as Dan, yeah, as my friends talked to me about it, I, I help them understand that, you know, she's still there. She still wants a sense of purpose and meaning and to be wanted. So what we got her doing was cleaning the potatoes that next year. And she wasn't able to make the mashed potatoes. That instruction would be way too much. But having a bowl of water, a bowl of potatoes, and a scrubber brush, and then a place to put them once they're clean, she was able to clean the potatoes. And then she still had enough of her motor skills that she was able to peel the potatoes. Okay? So that was a lovely alternative. And then she was part of the dinner. Okay, so that cued activity allowed her to stay significant and stay engaged, which really meant a lot. Uh, muscle memory action. Things like brushing your teeth can often be preserved till very late if your motor skills can do that. Um, putting a hand out to shake is one of the most fundamental muscle memory actions that we have, although we don't do that these days. Um, initiation and termination. One of the things that gets forgotten is bathing. They don't the whole sequence seems too much. Maybe that sensory thing of the water. A lot of people with dementia don't like the sense of shower, that, that water on their skin is very uncomfortable, so we move toward baths. Um, or they just simply forget their olfactory is diminished, so they're not smelling that they need to be changed. The logic isn't there. The, the sense of time is gone, so they don't know how long it's been since they last bathed. Okay. Um, the need for sensation can become extreme. So this doing part, people can wear themselves raw with washing their hands or something. They get into a habit of doing something over and over because they're looking for sensation. Chewing, a lot of people can chew their mouth because they're trying to get some sensation, but then they don't realize they're doing it too much. And they can get sore. So keeping liquid is a good thing for that. Um, and this is where a lot of the police situations come up. The guy walking down the freeway, he's focused on one thing. He doesn't really have a sense of uh, safety and he's trying to get somewhere and all those lot, it's gone. Um, people picking up stuff in a store and walking out without paying. There's just gaps in things. Um, public indecency can sometimes happen with dementia where people are touching themselves in ways that other people get upset by not understanding that it's a cognitive decline situation. So um, having law enforcement familiar with dementia is so important. Okay, so what we need to understand uh, to support and minimize these difficult behaviors. First is dynamic assessment. And with this, as we approach somebody, whether this is in a professional setting with someone we don't know well, or with a loved one on Tuesday, Okay, we want to approach them thoughtfully, thinking about they may be tired, they may or may not have their hearing aids in. Okay, there are a couple of really basic things, but they almost also just may not be firing as well today. They may have been frightened by something we have no idea occurred. The ice maker could be really noisy and they're agitated and heightened because of the sound they couldn't identify. And we don't even think about it. So we want to approach thoughtfully. One of the first things that we do is from a distance, we want to say hello from a nice amount of space so that they don't feel encroached on. I say about six feet or a little bit more, hey mom. And 
You don't need this at the earliest stage of dementia, but this practice, think about the pieces of this because they can be really helpful. Hi, mom, from a distance, loud. See if they respond, see if they lift their head. Once you get eye contact, the hand is a pretty common thing for a hand gesture. So putting it up near your eyes is gonna help encourage the eye contact. Squat down if you need, get down to their level. Don't hover and lean in because like I'm doing on the video, that's daunting. You fill their whole spatial field, it's kind of scary. But if you get down, that doesn't feel like it's a threatening. So hi, reach your hand out. See if they reach their hand out. See if they sit back like this. So you can get a lot of read from that person before you've even gotten real close to them. Are they hearing you? Are they seeing you? Do they recognize you? If you say, hi, mom, and who are you? So you can get a lot of information. Um, hi, Mrs. Smith, I'm Annie. I'm here to help you with blah, blah today. That's a lot of information. To you and me, it feels like we're being courteous. But is that just flooding them? Okay, you need to slow down and start over. So this dynamic assessment coming in and then taking their hand can be really nice, but you need to see that that's received. So approach them thoughtfully, watch for all these things. You're gathering information that entire time, response time, hearing, recognizing, mood. Are they happy to see you or are they pensive? Okay. And then you wanna meet the person living with dementia where they are in that moment because they may have been very different at your visit yesterday, or they may have been very different before lunch than after lunch. A person with dementia, again, that chemical change and all the variables that can affect their world and their amygdala can change moment to moment. Um, there's a lot more information on this. The links here, Tipa Snow, who I'm a certified coach and trainer with her programs. She's, she's really the go-to for dementia training. She's extraordinary. Has a lot of videos available. You can go on YouTube. Um, there's a lot more information there that you can self-train quite a bit. And then there's courses available throughout the year, online, everywhere. So that's worth looking at if you want to learn more, especially about approach. Um, so that connection. Our amygdala, one of the things of feeling unsafe is feeling unwanted, um, confused by the environment. So if we are feeling connected with someone, all those things are going to feel a bit more at ease. And what we want to be creating for our person is that they're at ease more of the time, not heightened and fearful. So we want to connect before we physically contact, okay? Don't ever touch out of the blue. Don't come up behind and put a hand on a shoulder. As much as to you, that's a loving thing. To them, it's touch out of nowhere, okay? Come around front, hey dad, and then make sure they see you first. Get, if their head is down, if there's somebody who's stuck in this position, get down below, get, but make sure that your, your touch that's well-intended doesn't come frightening to them, okay? And we always wanna think about doing with someone, not at someone, to someone. Um, the number of times that I'll get a spouse saying, oh, I'm just gonna do the laundry, it's just easier, it's hard. And then they do everything around the person and the person's not involved with anything. Or they're talking to somebody else. This, this is hard in some of the memory care communities. If you go at mealtime, the good ones, it doesn't happen. And the good carers, it doesn't happen. But it's very often that you'll see somebody putting a spoon to somebody's mouth while they're talking to Judy across the room about what they did last night. That's doing to somebody. You're shoving the spoon without being with them. Don't do that. Okay, um, there is even a way, and I can help train, where you can have your hand cradling their hand. If they've lost the motor skills for the utensil, you can do it so that their hand is actually moving to their own mouth. That keeps more cognitive systems firing. It keeps more self-engagement. It's very valuable. If they've lost the motor skills, we can still do with them, not to them. Um, and this quote's been placed to Maya Angelou and many people before her, but the thought overall of they'll remember how you made them feel. They may not remember exactly what you did, but they'll remember how you made them feel and feelings are paramount. Okay, quick time check. Um, so one of the things is show me, don't only talk to me. When we hear somebody call our name, we turn to look, okay? We don't 
move our ear closer. Our, our eyes are the first way humans take in information, but we're talkers. And we just think if we say it, it's good enough. But we want to think about the fact of how vital the eyes are in communication. Granted, there are going to be people with vision changes, hearing changes. That obviously is a secondary aspect. But as a norm, our eyes are our best way as humans to take in information. So you want to pair your words with visual cues. And one example I use is, hey, Robin, do you want something cold or hot? So now I'm not just saying, do you want something cold or hot, which she may not recognize, but oh, that's the one that ice goes in, or oh, war oh, that sounds good, coffee. Okay, it gives a visual cue, a sensory, all of that. It's gonna trigger more possibility for the communication you wanna have happen, okay, when you give them the visual cues. Signs on bathroom doors that show bathroom. Um, people put photos on the outside of their cupboards as somebody starts to decline to know where to look for things. Um, visual representation can be really valuable. And even if it's, are you thirsty or hungry? Are you cold? Okay, there's lots of ways that we can pair our verbal message. And we want to use fewer words. I'm bad at that. <laughs> um, the last part of this one really is that our emotions are louder than our words. So logic and language are gone on the left side. Remember this? Our emotions are still there. If I've had a morning where the sheets are soiled and I got to get to the doctor to get the pharmacy and I got it. Uh, Hi, Robin, I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you is not what's coming across, okay? We do this in our own life and with dementia, it is to an extreme. So we need to think about, whew, okay, today's gonna be a doozy, shake it off. Take a few deep breaths, take care of your own wellness, be compassionate with yourself because you got a lot to do and go, okay, hey, Robin, Glad to see you. Okay, that's what we want to come in with because the words are the least important in that, that equation. It's how our emotions are coming in. And even when we think we're not being tense, over and over and over, I see it with people with dementia. If we're, okay, hi, I'm really glad to be here with you. They're, they're sensing all of that. They're, it's, it's that thing of some senses go away and other things get heightened. They are picking up on the emotions. So we need to check ourselves with that. So show me, okay? Meet me by mirroring. The mirroring is extraordinary and this is a way to connect, okay? So I couldn't come up with a great picture for this, but I think the cat's cute. The thought of, okay, what do we have here? We wanna mirror energy tone and words. Yes, words start to go, but still they can be valuable. We had a woman when I worked in memory care and she would come out about four o'clock every day, storming into the area that was the main community social area and where the dining room was across from the kitchen. What, what am I supposed to, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing and nobody cares and my sister locked me up here. I'm just gonna get naked. And she would literally start stripping down in the hallway outside the kitchen. So everybody was used to this. And this was just this thing that would happen. And come on, let's get our clothes and push her back to her room. I started getting a little curious. And so I, in this idea of mirroring, and I said, wow, you're really mad, aren't you? Yeah, I'm really mad. She said, well, what, what's going on? And I met her there rather than coming and going, oh, it's okay. And she said, yeah, I'm really mad. I said, well, what are you mad about? And I brought myself down a little bit. And she said, well, I'm, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing. Well, what would you like to be doing? Well, I, I, I'm hungry. Oh, we're gonna have dinner in a few minutes. Oh, and by then I had my hand on her low back and we were walking back toward her room, okay? I met her and suddenly she felt seen and the battle lasted that long rather than that long and no clothes were removed, okay? So I mirrored her anxiety and anger and was able to then by mirroring, meet her there, okay? She felt seen. If somebody is really sad and they're really, really unhappy and you come in, you're like, it's okay. All that person's gonna feel is dissonance and like, you don't fit with me, okay? So if you meet me with calm when I'm really amped up, what you're telling me is we are not together in this. You're telling me, I'm not safe with you because you're over here, I'm over here. 
But if you can meet them where they are, boy, yeah, you're really sad today, aren't you? What are you thinking about? And then maybe they stay a bit sad, but at least they feel connected with, and then you can move to, well, let's go see if a cup of tea, and maybe there's some birds out the window we can go look at. You know, then you can start to connect and move from that space into the next engagement, okay? Um, human beings really need to feel a sense of identity. A lot of the depression in seniors is due to lack of purpose, lack of connection, okay? Um, being wanted. That example of the woman doing the laundry and around her husband and everything, when she got to having him fold socks, he at least felt like he had something to do and he wasn't just in her way. That's what he was able to express to me. He's like, I just feel bad that I can't do much, but I'm always in her way. Pardon me. And once he got to have a sense of purpose, that, that feels much better. So this little sad dog is the way we unintentionally make people feel with dementia a lot of the time. You just, I'll just do it. It's easier if I just do it. Or taking care of tasks because suddenly, maybe in a couple, you're needing to now do the bookkeeping and get the trash out and all the groceries. You already did all the cooking, but you're, you're amped up and this person's over here not able to do the banking and the bookkeeping and the trash anymore but they're sitting there with nothing. So we want to figure out what can they still do? Peel the potatoes. Another thing that Thanksgiving that they did, um, that wasn't my suggestion, I love this, was she started getting agitated as the meal was getting close and they were going to set the table. So they set one place and then all the items for the other, I think it was like 16 places, but they gave her a template and then specific instructions she was able to follow the template and set the table. There she's wanted, she's not in the way in the kitchen. She's got her identity, okay? These things really, really matter. Um, great ways to do this are using please and thank you. Can you please just try a bite and saying thank you? That always feels good to us. Asking, and this is a great way to get somebody moving. <laughs> this, is, this is a good trick that a lot of us use. Can you help me with something over here? I, I, I could use a hand. Who doesn't want to feel helpful, right? Oh, oh yeah, I'll, I'll help you with that. You know, that makes everybody feel good. Also opinions, which of these do you like? Do you like the blue one or the red one? Getting them engaged and asking for their input, okay? This woman just represents everything I want my people with dementia to feel. She looks safe, she looks calm. And for us as the well partners, I want more of this because I get the call from people that are burnt out and exhausted. And yes, there are things that are going to be really, really hard, but there is a whole lot more connection and ease available. And this please and thank you, I've had some couples call me and say, that was a game changer. <laughs> you know, can you help me? Boy, I use that all the time now. So it really makes a difference when you feel that connection. Um, they're lost. They need you to help bring them back in. Okay. Um, so the things we wanted to look at were their brain changes. We looked at the diagrams and things that show that a bit. What's changing in their perceptions and experiences and why behavior actually changes. People say, God, they've just gotten so difficult. They just don't care anymore. Well, apathy is a common response. If you're just exhausted and overwhelmed, you just kind of stop. So that's part of why those behaviors get difficult and what we need to understand and support to minimize those behaviors, okay? Um, I love this quote of the relationship is critical, not the outcome of the encounter. For example, if it's the day you think you're gonna be getting a, giving somebody a bath and they're just fighting it, you know what? Hey mom, how about we just do a little bit of peri care and call it good, all right? Let's do that. Then we'll go get some ice cream, you know? hey. <laughs> if ice cream works. Um, but the, the relationship and that way you make them feel, um, that sticks around, okay? This right side of the brain can hang on to some new information. The woman who had to give medication in the community, some people would see her coming and they'd just be mad. They always loved me because I was the activities director and I brought snacks and bingo. So, 
even though it, I hadn't seen them in three or four days, they had an emotional memory of me. So that's not just a fleeting moment. Those emotional things stayed. And families can go one way or the other with that. And so we want to do all we can preserve, do to preserve the positive feelings that they're going to have because they don't have the logic for why they feel that way. They just know they like you or they don't. So we want to work with that. Um, and so it really starts with connection, getting curious, being creative. What's their safe? Okay. If you ever get where nothing is working, everything's wrong, go, okay, they're really agitated. What would have them feel safe right now? If you can come back to one thing, come back to that. How can I help them feel safe? Okay. And knowing about the person is a big part because you'll know more of what works for them, what doesn't. One woman, when she gets agitated, her family puts on a Western. She loves old Westerns. That's her thing. I never would have thought of that. Check in with yourself. What are you bringing into it? Your tone over your terms, because the words may be gone, but what energy are you bringing? And mirroring them will help them feel seen and safe. Um, valuing me, valuing the individual, show them that they're needed and that they're wanted. That's one of the things that people with early stage memory loss say, I don't feel like they want me here. And, and we don't ever want to do that to our loved one. Okay, so thank you so much. These two quotes have been uh, uh, attributed to a variety of people, but the one I, I said earlier of they may forget what you said, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And then the newer one is we have to change our minds about people whose minds have changed. So thank you so much. Uh, we've got time for some questions, I believe. Yes, and I just, I, this is this is Robin Shapiro on the board chair, and uh, so appreciative, Annie. That was that was really fantastic. Um, this is the time that we can take questions uh, through the chat function if you would like to ask any questions. And in thinking about um, in thinking about uh, the uh, presentation that we just saw, I had a couple questions, which was, I mean, the examples that you gave were so fantastic. And I am wondering if, um, I'm wondering if the stuck in a loop uh, mm -hmm. issue, if you could give us some, some suggestions as to how to get out of the, you know, putting on oh, six yeah. pairs of underwear kind of thing. <laughs> uh, that, would be, yep. that would be helpful to understand. Yep. Um, one of the great things with, with the loops is inquiring of them. Mm -hmm. Oh, what are you working on? Oh, I got to get ready for work. Oh, okay. Well, and then hand them the pants potentially, um, show them the next item. We had a woman, my friend's mom, um, she actually flew away and was calling me about things, would get up from dinner, take her fork, put it in the freezer. And then five minutes later, get up, take the fork out of the freezer, put it on the table. Five minutes later, put it back in the freezer. They never figured out what it was, but mm -hmm. she gave her two forks so she could have one in the freezer and one on the table and that stopped the action. Oh, interesting. I don't know what it was about. We never yeah. really figured that part out. Um, thinking about if, because it is likely that they were starting a sequence, mm -hmm. thinking about what would the likely next step be? Um, we had one guy who he wasn't stuck in a loop, but he put the he squoze the toothpaste on the toothbrush and then just sat there and stared at it because he couldn't figure out what comes next. I said, Oh, do you need to get that wet? Ah, okay, there we go. Mm -hmm. Um, so so sometimes it stops, sometimes it's a loop, but what is the next step to what your perception is of what they're doing? Or can they tell you what they were working on? And then you say, Oh, oh, okay, then you'll need a belt for your pants, mm -hmm. right? And that can sometimes just click and then they move again mm -hmm. okay yeah yeah um things like repeated phone calls uh a lot of times daughters will call and say mom calls me 25 times a day how do i do that there are things like big notes that are physical reminders that they can see visual physical reminders mm -hmm. i will call you at these times or this is where i am that can work sometimes mm -hmm. um getting a big whiteboard set up as a message center near the coffee pot or whatever they're, what, what's a habit that's already there, we'll put a message center next to that that says today is boom. This is what's happening at this time and give them something that earlier on they can pattern and get familiar with going to because that pattern can stay with them. New patterns can be learned in early dementia. And so we really try and earlier on build in some habits that will help 
facilitate that person's independence. Mm -hmm. so. And I loved your comments about, um, you know, how you're making people feel. I mean, I think that that can be applied to everyone in every <laughs> situation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In terms of, you know, when we're talking about the whole person, I think a lot of the a lot of the things that you talked about today could be applied to anyone, anywhere, anytime. Yeah. And so um, I'm curious uh, for, for advocates who are working with clients mm -hmm. and well partner, where there is a um, frustration or burnout or things like that, are there things that advocates can do to help uh, the couple Mm -hmm. and family get past the frustration and back to the love and the positive and the place i find that access is really um somewhat those brain images mm -hmm. are one of the first ahas is oh wow okay they're not doing this that that part isn't even there anymore or it's deteriorating yeah i thought are, that was i thought that was so amazing to see those and i have never seen that quite oh. like that um and i'm curious if somebody wanted like a postcard of those brain images like where even would you find that because wow they're available mm -hmm. and i actually have been working with a guy at um I think it's UC San Diego. I'm trying to get some better PET scan images that show the amygdala. Um, they're the, the red, blue, green brain mm -hmm. images that show where the glucose is burning. And it shows the amygdala actually more active in the dementia brain than in the normal brain. And it's really eye-opening. Um, you know, I have the slides from trainings I've done. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, as a postcard, that's a really interesting thing. Um, welcome to share my slides. Um, a lot of what I have, I have through permission of being the certified coach and trainer with Tipa mm -hmm. Snow. Mm -hmm. The images are available there, but they're also mm -hmm. readily available through a Google search. Yeah. Um, it is eye-opening to see the brain scans, for sure. Um, I, I think if anybody got upset with their loved one and saw that big black gap yeah it's just a good reminder of what is possible and not possible so there's the drama mm -hmm. there's the part that goes oh you know mm -hmm. that impact that sometimes mm -hmm. as humans we need to have mm -hmm. and then bringing in the compassion with that of okay the so what of that is logic Se sequencing is one of the things that people well, why, why can't he remember to just da da da? I, I, you know, make his own sandwich or something. Um, brushing your teeth. You got to get the tube. You got to get the tapa. You got to get the bread. You got the. It's a lot of steps. Mm -hmm. And when they start to realize, oh wait, those steps aren't even working anymore. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that's extraordinary, and I got to go through it recently at Murano Senior Living, is the actual dementia experience, where they put. Um, something in your shoes that has kind of needly pins that are poking your feet. Mm -hmm. They put weights on your knees, uh, gloves on that have it. So it, it represents arthritic hands, but also the lack of, of small motor skills mm -hmm. and goggles, headphones that are just making this kind of noise that we know a lot of people with dementia are just having this not tinnitus, but, but just noise and, and things that are louder and don't make sense. And you have to go into a room and you have to look for certain things. You have to perform certain tasks. It, it most people come out crying. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, and, but and, we can't set that up for every single family all the time, but that dementia right. experience. Yeah. And, uh, and where did you experience that? I got to do it at Murano Senior Living. They were doing it in their new memory care. They're one of the leisure care communities, downtown Seattle. Okay. And they, they had it, but and I can look at that, Robin, that might actually be something to bring in, but the dementia experience, there are, there are groups that have all the materials. I've done it with goggles where I, I bring people down to having this much vision and their hands wrapped with, I use painter's tape and cotton balls, mm -hmm. and then they need to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it, it just very Good quickly, luck. <laughs> but, but the brain scan mm -hmm. paired with the what that lobe does, what that section has diminished. Um, mm -hmm. And let me 
just, I'm going to jump back here one sec. Um, this one is as far as my trainings, the one that gets people, oh, this is sorry, going to take a minute. The most aha moment mm -hmm. is the three parts of the brain, the left, right, this guy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is the one where people go, wow, that lose on the left language. Wow. They lose nouns. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. executive functioning, people don't always know exactly what executive functioning means, but as yeah. you break it down, the ability to, to uh, plan, to move forward, to do any activity that has more than two or three steps. And most of the things we do in life do. Right. Uh, you know, they really do. And all, yeah. all that's gone. And then that the right side is where we can access them. Yeah. Once they get a little, they can get back to compassion from anger or frustration. And then you get those moments where you connect. Mm -hmm. If you do that mirroring and it can be kind of playful. If you, hey, mom, can you help me? And you see, then, then that tide can turn pretty dramatically. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I just want to thank you so much. This I've learned a lot today myself awesome. and um, I've known you for a long, long <laughs> time, but uh, the, I the, doing this. <laughs> we're just really appreciative of sharing your wisdom and your insights. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to remind people that Annie will be on the Wahova app and she's available to answer your questions. You can direct message her. And um, thank you so, so much and look it's forward fun. to hopefully seeing you virtually and maybe in person sometime. maybe in person again one we're day gonna, yeah. <laughs> we're going to be optimistic about that thanks so much and bonnie has asked uh, privately yes that slides will be shared are you yes slides oh, yes so slides will be shared uh through the app Great. so um that is where to find them yeah. okay okay thanks so much thank, thank you care, so everyone. much